Hello, LTU Game Audio students, and welcome back to another edition of Unreal Engine 4 Study Hall. This is Ben Blau, and today we're going to be discussing the use of sound mix modifiers inside of Unreal Engine 4. Specifically, we're going to be looking at a common mixing mechanic known as ducking. Now, if you are already an audio engineer or mixer or practitioner, you may already be familiar with this concept. And uh, what it is, is a process by which we can cause one or more sounds in a mix to automatically lower in volume, at least, automatically lower themselves in volume when in the presence of another sound. A common example of this is, let's say you've got a very busy mix, maybe it's a film soundtrack or maybe it's a video game, uh, and it's full of music and sound effects and also contains dialogue. So uh, you go to play the dialogue and the dialogue is uh, difficult to make out, right? Uh, sometimes because of the fact that the mix is so crowded, there's so much going on that the dialogue gets masked by all this other stuff. Now, the, uh, a novice, let's say, uh, their urge would be to take the dialogue track and just increase it in level. But remember, in digital audio, we do have a finite amount of headroom, so always turning things up is not a good strategy. Sometimes we have to think about, well, what is getting in the way of this sound that, that we're straining to hear? And maybe I will turn those down subtly only when this other sound is present, okay? So for example, let's say we had music and sound effects that were making the dialogue harder to hear. We can set it up so that when the dialogue is present, the music and or sound effects automatically lower in volume by the amount that we desire and only for the duration that we desire. Let's say the duration of a specific line of dialogue. So I'm going to get right to it and show you the implementation of this uh, in Unreal. To get us started, I'm going to navigate to our root content directory, and we're going to make a new folder, which I will call audio, like so. Now, sometimes uh, there's a delay on that because of my screen recorder. I am pressing enter, um, but uh, for some reason, my screen recorder <laughs> causes that to bug out. So let's try not to make too many, there it goes. Okay, let's try, let's try to avoid making too many folders here. I think for that reason, I'm not going to make subfolders here. But now I'm going into my audio folder and I'm gonna open my Windows File Explorer or uh, if you're on a Macintosh, you would open like a finder window and navigate to where you keep your sound effects. Uh, for this particular example, we're going to use a music loop that I quickly threw together. Uh, and I have two recorded lines of dialogue from, well, one from our hero, our main character, we're gonna call hero. Uh, no, don't use that as a template. Who told you you could do that? And uh, maybe one of these lines of dialogue from the companion, okay? That should be all we need. Um, one of these uh, needs to be looping, so I'll open up that sound and uh, just make sure that looping is set to true. And we'll save it that way. Let me get my meeting controls just out of the way a little bit, and I will close that asset. And the other two will not be looping by default, as you can see. So we can save that, and I can just highlight this in Command S. So now all three are saved. And uh, the music uh, loop, we can, right away, we can make into a sound cue. So uh, again, my meeting controls are in the way, so let's get them out of the way. Right click, and we're gonna create cue from that particular wave asset. So we'll hit create cue. I can rename it if I want, but I don't think it's really necessary. And that's just something that I whipped up uh, uh, very, very quickly prior to starting this video. I can hear the effects of the data compression on this, so we'll talk about uh, how to preserve better audio quality when importing wave assets into Unreal uh, in another lesson. But today, we're just gonna use this as is. Uh, we can open that up. Okay, there's our music loop. We have to click the wave, the wave player and uh, check looping again, okay? And we'll save our sound cue like that. And now we can just bring this into our world 
It is set to auto activate, so as soon as I enter play, we should hear the music. Okay, nothing particularly special about the music. I'm also going to create sound cues, uh, one sound cue for this line of dialogue from our hero, uh, and then the uh, one line of dialogue from the companion that we have yet to put into the scene. So let's take our hero dialogue. We'll make a sound cue for that. I'll call it here. I don't have to call it. I don't have to rename it. We just have to open it. There's the wave player not looping in this case, and uh, you'll be able to hear I'm almost done here. Just a few more moments. I'm almost done here. Just a few more moments. Uh, I don't really love the pitch on that. So let's just take the pitch multiplier, maybe 1.12. I'm almost done here. Just a few more moments. Okay. I'm almost done here. That was just an aesthetic choice. So I can save that sound cue as it is. And uh, our companion's line, we'll make a cue out of that. Double. Captain, I think. Oh, open that up. And that's not a looping wave, okay? And let's see what we think about the pitch here. Play cue. Captain, I think the ship's in trouble. Okay, both of Captain, I think the ship's both of them you probably noticed already there's a little bit of, of deliberate distortion uh, as well as some other effects that I cooked into those wave assets uh, in my DAW, okay, just to make them sound like they were sort of radioing in over each other's headsets uh, or you know something of that nature. But let's lower the response pitch a little bit and see. Captain, I think the ship's in trouble. Okay. Captain, I think the ship's in trouble. Let's try 0.925. Round it off. Captain, I think the ship's in trouble. Okay, that sounds just fine. So we'll save it that way. And now we've got three sound cues, one of which is already in the level, uh, which is our music loop. And then we've got these other two sound cues that are ready to be used. Now, at this point, I would typically uh, go back to my content folder or maybe even in our audio folder here and make a subfolder for our sound, uh, our sound class assets. Um, I'm afraid of that uh, glitch happening again due to my screen recorder. So if it glitches out, I'll just pause the recording. Uh, I will try to make that folder now. So we're going to make a new folder and I'm going to call it sound class assets. I will attempt to press enter and oh, okay. That time it didn't happen. I wonder why it happened the first time and not this time, but Hey, I'm not complaining. This is exactly what I want. Sound class assets. And we'll go into there. You have worked with sound classes before. Okay. So you should know how to at least create them. Uh, right now, everything is set to, to the default master sound class, but uh, I'm going to replace that with a, a new master sound class, one that is our own. So we'll right click in the uh, empty area of the content browser and we're going to hover over sounds and we are going to hover then over classes and prepare more than one sound class here. We're going to start with sound class and I'm going to call this SC for sound class SC underscore base. Okay. And open it up. Okay. Now, what we want is for the base sound class uh, not to obey ambient volumes, okay? Not by default. Just like the master, the master sound class does not uh, have this checked. Um, uh, when we uh, assign the base uh, sound class to something like music, for example, or well, in this case, we're going to have a separate sound class for music, but for something that we don't want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, respect ambient volumes for things like uh, attenuation, occlusion, and uh, reverb, uh, things of that nature. Uh, the bass sound class, I don't think should do that. But I can make child sound classes right off of this node. So for example, one of those sound classes, child sound classes, I can just pull off and release my mouse and type a name for it. Let's say this one will be called Dialogue like that. 
So we have that. And we can pull off this pin one more time and uh, rename this child sound class music. And we could have another one called SFX for sound effects. And uh, even, even within these child classes, they can have children of their own, okay? So let's suppose that you had uh, a sound class called sound effects or SFX. Uh, it could have child classes, uh, you know, called weapons or, and then that weapons uh, child sound class could have children of its own, you know, they could be, uh, you know, melee weapons or superpowers or uh, uh, bullets or, you know, what, what have you, if you want to change their behavior. Uh, the only thing I want to change at the moment here is, you see, I can select these child sound classes just by clicking on them. And when I click on dialog, usually I do want dialog, uh, especially if it is regular dialog. Um, not something that's radioed in, but something that is spoken by a character with a location. Uh, I would want to enable apply ambient volumes for something like dialog, usually, okay? In today's example, maybe not, because the sound effects are meant to be transmitted, excuse me, the dialog lines are meant to be transmitted sort of like over the... Uh, radio communication system, so uh, they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't be subject to the acoustics of the space anyway. But this is just good practice. Notice, however, that the music sound class does not have apply ambient volumes uh, checked. So I'll save my bass sound class and close it, and then we'll see that the child classes will just appear here and here. Okay, and we will. Shift click to select them both and hit control S. Okay, and that will save them all. We also have to have another asset here. And the asset that's gonna be especially important to our ducking is going to be something called a sound class mix asset. We create that asset in the same way that we created the sound classes. We right click in the empty area, hover over sounds, then classes, and you'll notice that there's one other option here that says sound class mix. So let me grab one of those. And uh, I'm going to rename this just so that it's not ambig no ambiguity here. We'll call this Ducker, okay? Or to be uh, more precise, let's say SCM for Sound Class Mix Ducker. SCM does not have to be your particular convention. You can uh, uh, choose something else that makes sense to you, but SCM for my mind is how I designate Sound Class Mixes. Let's open that up and look at what's inside, okay? For one thing, uh, a Sound Class Mix allows us to apply EQ and here we have a full parametric equalizer, okay? Uh, if you're already an audio practitioner, you should know, you know, you probably already know a lot about EQ. So today's uh, conversation really isn't so much about using the EQ, but feel free to apply it uh, if you wish. And you'll understand, uh, uh, you know, once you finish uh, this lesson, you'll understand why you may or may not want to use that for... Uh, what we're doing today. So I'll turn that off for now. And uh, the real action is going to happen here where it says sound class effects, zero array elements. What I want to do now is I want to hit the plus button to add an array element. And then I'm going to twirl down on that disclosure triangle, if I can hit it. And it's asking for a sound class, and that sound class has not been populated here. So this is, if you're doing a ducker or something like a ducker, inside this sound class mix, where you have added this array element and it's asking for a sound class, the way that you should think about this is, what do I want this to apply to, okay? What we're trying to do is ducking. So that means that the music is meant to reduce itself in volume in the presence of dialogue. So what sound class needs to be affected is what we specify here, okay? And that's going to be my music sound class, okay? So what do we want to affect? In this case, we want it to affect the music. After all, it's the music that we intend to reduce in gain. While this sound mix is active, or pushed as it's called in Unreal language, <laughs> Unreal speak, 
uh, we while it's pushed, uh, we are going to let's say reduce it in volume from its default of 1.0. So, like I said earlier in this tutorial, I'm going to very much exaggerate this, okay, so that it is very very obvious that it's happening. Uh, and then we're going to dial back the settings to something more realistic. But for now, let's set this to something like 0 0.2. 0 0.2, its original volume, okay? Now, uh, I'll do that only. There's You could also affect the pitch uh, if you wanted to. Uh, uh, know that in Unreal Engine 4, when you adjust a pitch adjuster, it will also... Uh, raise or lower the uh, the speed of the file. Uh, and it, it's actually playing it faster or slower uh, as if you were playing a record or a tape at the wrong speed. Um, but we can we can screw around with that later for fun, just if you're curious. We can also use a low pass filter. Right now, the default uh, low pass filter cutoff frequency is set at 20,000, and that is in hertz. So an audio engineer would call that 20 kilohertz or 20K. And that's about the highest audio frequency that a person can hear, that an average person can hear if you have healthy hearing. Um, Occasionally, even in a ducker, what I might do is I might reduce this to some lower frequency because a low pass filter is also sometimes called a high cut filter, meaning that if I were to set this to a lower frequency, let's say if I set it to 5000, then it's going to begin filtering out treble frequencies starting at around 5 kilohertz or 5,000 hertz. Um, and uh, that might not necessarily be so bad because while it's ducked, if we also roll off some of the high frequencies, uh, that makes it less likely that our uh, speech frequencies, speech intelligibility frequencies, which are usually between about 2 and 5 kilohertz anyway, uh, are going to be less masked because uh, we're going to be uh, filtering out uh, some of that sound. Uh, I could even maybe uh, increase this uh, to 2,500. And while the ducker is pushed or active, now even more high frequencies are going to be taken away. Probably a lot. As a matter of fact, I'm going to exaggerate it. I'll set it to 1,000. And that way we can listen to these independently and, uh, uh, and you'll hear their effects. And then, of course, uh, uh, we can scale it back to more realistic values. Now, these changes, okay, are going to be subject to the time constants that we set down here. Uh, when this sound mix is pushed, you can enter an initial delay. Now, an initial delay, you know, it's very, very rare that I manipulate that parameter for any reason. Usually, uh, if it's something like ducking, I want the ducking to uh, happen not absolutely instantaneously, but for it to blend in uh, rather than snap in all at once. And that I can accomplish with the fade in time. Notice that there's a fade in time and there's also a fade out time. And sometimes that language can be confusing to an audio engineer because if you're an audio engineer, when you think of this term fade in, that usually implies that something is coming up in volume, fading up sometimes even from silence, but getting louder. And when we see this term fade out, we're assuming that something is getting quieter. But uh, that is not what these, what these terms mean in this context, okay? As a matter of fact, I think you're better off if you substitute in your mind for fade in time, substitute blend in time, and for fade out time, in your mind, think of it as blend out time. Because really what's happening when this uh, mix modifier is pushed, it's going to, uh, uh, it's going to blend to the settings that I have entered up here, okay, according to these time values. So again, let's exaggerate this. Well, uh, in certain sense, okay, like 0.2 is a pretty good fade in time, honestly, for ducking. So I want that to happen pretty quickly. Uh, and we've already re reduced it in volume by a lot. And the duration, let me set that for something longer than I would typically need. That's in seconds. So I'll set that to four seconds. Of course, we're not going to leave it that way. 
And then the fade out time or blend out time, I'm also going to set this to a larger value than I normally would. Let's say uh, two and a half seconds. Okay, 2.5. And remember, uh, what this means is that it's going to take it 2.5 seconds after this sound mix has been pushed, uh, after the dialogue finishes, it's going to take two and a half seconds for it to restore uh, back to its uh, default volume setting. Okay, so this is uh, very much exaggerated, and I'm going to save our ducker. Okay, now remember, our ducker. Uh, is um, uh, has been applied to the music sound class, but it has to be called whenever dialogue is present. So let's go to the dialogue sound class now and set that up to push this sound mix whenever dialogue is happening. So here in our dialogue sound class, let's make sure that dialogue is highlighted right here in the graph. And uh, it's in this area, let me pull this pane over just to show you what it says, passive sound mix modifiers. Passive because we're going to set this up to happen automatically whenever there is dialogue. However, uh, activating and deactivating sound mixes uh, is very, very easy to do in Blueprints, uh, Blueprint script. And I'm going to show you how to do that as well a little bit later on. Uh, but for now, uh, uh, it's going to be passive, okay? So uh, we have to add now an array element, because right now this is empty. So let's hit the plus sign, twirl down the disclosure triangle. And now look what it's asking for. It's asking for a sound mix. When I pull down the drop down, we shouldn't expect to see too many, because we only made one. Okay, so let's see what's in there. Okay, our ducker, sound class mix ducker. So that's now in there. Usually, you don't have to play with the threshold controls. Okay, so we're going to leave those alone for the time being. And I'll save that uh, with that applied. Great. Okay, now let's go back and uh, we are going to assign our wave assets and also our sound cues to the appropriate sound classes. Our music loop, it, I don't want that in our master sound. I could leave it that way if I wanted to, but uh, uh, no, we made a music sound class of our own. So we're going to assign it there and save. That's the wave asset. And now we're going to do the same thing in the sound cue if you've implemented this in a sound cue. So that's going to go to the music sound class. Now, uh, technically, the fact that I assigned that sound class to the raw wave asset, you technically could skip that if you know for a fact that you're going to be using it in a queue and you uh, make sure that you don't forget to set the sound class in the queue. But uh, if I want to use this wave uh, in some other way, not inside of a music queue, um, if I assign the sound class to the wave asset, it retains the behavior uh, that we set up for that particular class. So I like to do it in the wave asset, but also in the queue. So let's start with our, uh, or not start with, we already did our music loop. Let's do our hero dialogue. That's going to go to the dialogue sound class. We'll save it that way. And we'll do that to the queue as well. Dialogue. Save, and we'll do it to the other line of dialogue, which, are, which is our companion dialogue. Uh, the class will be dialogue. Save, and for the queue as well, we'll assign that to the dialogue sound class. Save. Okay, so right now we're getting, we're getting close. Uh, in order to have some very simple dialogue, I'm not going to set up a, a complex dialogue system right now, but we'll do a simple one. Uh, to begin with, I'll need someone to converse with, and for that I'll make just a simple AI or NPC by taking our default third-person character, right-click, and what we're going to do is we're going to duplicate this, okay? So duplicate, and I'm just going to name it AI underscore BP, uh, and that'll keep our lives simple, okay? So let's open that up, 
and uh, I'm going to head over to the viewport first. One thing I want to do right away is to make this mesh look a little bit different just so that we can distinguish it from our uh, uh, third person character. And I picked up a trick somewhere along the way. I'm, I'm so sorry, I don't remember uh, who it was that I got this from, but I found out uh, that if you take a uh, the default third person mannequin, the SK mannequin, and instead of using the default material for the body, uh, if you <laughs> use the starter content chair material, uh, you're going to be amazed at what this does. So let me just search for chair. This is the material applied to the starter content chair, but I'm going to apply it to this skeletal mesh here and let the shaders compile for a second. And you'll see this does something pretty fun. It makes the, <laughs> it makes our, our character look something like a, like a superhero. Okay. Or something like that. Anyway, it definitely looks different from the, uh, uh, normal third person character. So let's compile and save. Now that I've done that, uh, I could of course delete a lot from here, but I'm not going to, it's not going to get in the way of what we're doing today. Um, we're going to use simple overlap events just to, just to trigger some very, very simple dialogue. And to do that, I'm going to use, uh, uh, overlaps. To start, I'll select the mesh because I want my, I'm going to make a box collision here in a moment, but I want it to be, I want it to be parented by, parented by, I don't like the term parented to because that just doesn't seem logical, uh, but parented by our skeletal, our skeletal mesh. So I'll highlight that first before I add the component, we can search for collision. Oops. Doesn't take long to get a box collision. And now we're going to just scale this around the character appropriately so that there's enough room for our, oops, for our NPC, not our NPC, but for our player character to overlap it. Okay, so we'll bring this forward. Um, this is deliberately asymmetrical because I don't want to initiate conversation from overlapping behind this uh, AI, but rather in front of the AI. And maybe we can make this a little wider, just so it's a little bit more forgiving. That doesn't bother me at all. Okay, so compile and save along the way. Now let's head over to the event graph and write the logic for this. Okay, find some empty space. And coming off of your box collision here, which you could rename if you wanted to, like something like a uh, dialog box, I'm not going to bother. We'll right click and we're going to create two events. The first, of course, is going to be add on component begin overlap. Okay. And then we're going to do another one, right click, add event. And what do you think it's going to be? On event end overlap. Okay. So now we've got both of those nodes. Um, all right. So we're overlapping and un and end overlapping the box. Okay. That's what's going to fire off the code that comes next. Now off of on component begin overlap, let's uh, pull off and start with a cast. Cast to, oops, cast tote, cast to third person character and connect our other actor to the object pin as we normally would. Now, uh, usually as soon as I set up a cast, uh, I like to take this as third person character and uh, promote it to a variable. So we'll right click on that pin, promote to variable. That's fine. And you'll now notice that it is right here in uh, uh, our details panel, and I can drag that into the graph again, should I need it. And I'm going to need it just a little bit. Okay. So cast a third person character and, uh, on component begin overlap. Let's just play a sound, not at location, but we'll do play sound 2d. Uh, and the reason that I'm choosing this over, uh, uh, play sound uh, at location or spawn sound at location, which you could also do, by the way, this absolutely works on 3d sounds. Uh, but because this is sort of being communicated over like headset radios, 
Uh, it, it really isn't subject to the acoustics of the space, and I don't have an audio volume in the arena right now anyway, so it shouldn't really matter. Play Sound 2D is going to be the simplest way to go. If I used a 3D sound, keep in mind that I would also have to get the uh, locations of those two actors so that the, the sounds play at the correct locations. But this is not going to require that. So Play Sound 2D. And uh, the first thing is going to be I want uh, the companion uh, to speak the first line of dialogue. So I'll select that, not the sound wave, but the cue that we made, uh, which is companion dialogue. I think it's companion dialogue. You know what? I forgot. I better just double check. Do, 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 do. Content, audio. Uh, yeah, dialogue 01 cue. All right. So dialogue 01Q, and that's going to be uh, what happens when we uh, overlap that box. Now, um, I don't want to do a redundant cast, right? That's, that's not computationally lean, which is why I made that variable. Okay, we're going to bring that here into our graph, get as third person character. So that provides a full reference to it. And we'll uh, come off of the execution pin on component end overlap, and we'll start here by doing a branch that will only continue the uh, logic flow according to when a condition is met. And the condition in this case is whether or not the other actor is equal to the third person character. So we'll, we'll do this using an equal Boolean, okay? We've used those before also. Uh, we're gonna pull off of other actor now, and uh, we can either uh, type a search for equal Boolean or use the uh, shortcut, which is just to press the equal sign twice. Equal, equal, okay? And uh, the asset here is going to be third person character, okay? That's the uh, variable that we made. And here is just a Boolean. It either is or it isn't, and that will satisfy the condition or, uh, of this branch. Okay, so if the other actor is equal to our third person character, we don't have to do another cast because we already cast up here and we made a reference to it. Okay, uh, now we can simply pull off of the true pin and again play sound 2D. Okay, and our asset this time is going to be the hero Q. Okay, so this uh, should compile, yeah, with no errors. So far, so good. All right, so let's get out of this blueprint. Uh, looks like there are some things I haven't saved, so I'll just click Save All right now. And we are now ready uh, to pull our AI into the scene somewhere, put it right there, and I'm going to rotate it and stuff just so that it's facing our third person character, making it very easy to approach and uh, initiate conversation. And let me just make sure, doubly sure, that it's on the ground exactly. Okay. So uh, let's give this a shot and see what happens. We already know that the music's going to play automatically. Captain, I think the ship's in trouble! And we'll hear it recover. I'm almost done here. Just a few more moments. Okay, so hopefully that was exaggerated enough for you to hear the effect of the dip down in volume much more than we would actually use. That was, again, exaggerated, but maybe you also heard the effect of the uh, low pass filter, right? Try to listen to the music, not only getting quieter, but getting duller. Okay, I'll play that for you again. Captain, I think the ship's in trouble! I'm almost done here. Just a few more moments. Okay, so you can hear the filter is opening back up again uh, just as the volume comes up. So uh, I don't mind that at all, all right? Now that we have our system working, our simple dialogue and our ducker working, 
uh, it is quite obvious that it is overdone. So now it's time to go back in there and tweak the values. So we're going to go back to our audio directory and find our sound class mix. Uh, oh, that's in this folder and SCM Ducker. All right, now let's dial in some more realistic values. All right, uh, uh, the low pass filter, uh, maybe I'll set not as low, 2,500. We'll see. It kind of depends on how much treble, I guess, is in your music to begin with, right? Uh, so you're going to have to listen for that and decide uh, how low you want to set your own cutoff frequency. It'd be nice if there was a slope parameter here so we could decide how many dB per octave or something like that. Um, but uh, this is this is just fine. Uh, I don't need an, an initial delay. The fade in time of 0.2 works for me. A duration of four seconds uh, is arbitrary because the line of dialogue might last longer or shorter than four seconds. You could hear in play when I uh, initiated the first line of dialogue, the music did not restore itself to unity gain right away. It waited for a sec, or excuse me, yeah, waited for four seconds and then started to fade back up over two and a half seconds. Uh, so we never know uh, how long uh, of a duration this needs to be unless we make a ducker, I guess, for every single line of dialogue, but that would be absurd. So here's what you do. What you're going to do is you're going to enter a value of negative one, negative one. And uh, the reason that we use negative one, even though this is really counterintuitive, because we can't, <laughs> we can't go back in time, uh, it, what this means is that uh, when this uh, sound class mix is called, if this is set to negative one, all that means is that this sound mix is going to hold its value uh, or continue to be applied to uh, whatever sound class it's assigned to uh, until another mix modifier is pushed. And that will pop this sound mix. That's the terminology, okay? To push or to pop. That is the question. So uh, this will be popped uh, as soon as the dialogue is over, okay? Uh, and the fade out time, it shouldn't come up, you know, really, really slowly, like over two and a half seconds, okay? We want this to be kind of subtle, not super dramatic. So let's set this to maybe point uh, 150. And that's 150 milliseconds, okay? This is 200 milliseconds, the fade in time or blend in time, 200 milliseconds. Uh, that might be too slow. That's a quarter of a second. And fade out time, 0 0.15, that's 150 millisecond. That's an eighth of a second. Uh, that might be too fast. And if it is, we'll hear it and we'll come back and we'll readjust it. So let's save. Oh, yes. And of course, our volume. <laughs> Uh, the default value was 1, but I don't want it to go to 20% of uh, its initial value. So let's maybe set this to 0.8. Uh, okay, so we'll reduce it by 20%, let's say. And we'll save this. And now we don't have to reprogram anything, okay? Uh, this is just going to, uh, the mix modifier uh, has been changed. So we're going to hear that reflected in the dialogue now. I think the ship's in trouble! I'm almost done here. Just a few more moments. Okay, so I can hear it recovering uh, too slowly. And therefore, the fade-out time, I think, could possibly be even smaller. Okay, so let's try... Uh, oh, I don't know, 0 0.05. And the fade in time could probably uh, be shorter as well. So we'll do uh, 0.15. So that's 15 milliseconds. And uh, okay, so we've, we've, we've made that faster. But notice that while I was inside of the volume, because I set the duration to negative one, we didn't have the uh, uh, initial volume restore itself uh, while I was still inside that volume. It held that sound mix until uh, it was popped by my other character completing its line of dialogue. So we'll save that. 
and uh, go back into the game and we'll hear how it sounds. It's supposed to be subtle, just to make a little bit of room, extra room for dialogue intelligibility. That's what we're going for. Captain, I think the ship's in trouble. I'm almost done here. Just a few more moments. Okay, I beg your pardon, I misspoke about one thing. Uh, the volume did recover uh, while I was inside of that uh, uh, box collision, but uh, it, it just, I simply slipped my mind that we had two separate cues. So um, since they're both assigned to the dialogue class, uh, our sound mix is pushed when this character begins to speak, and as soon as the signal in that sound cue is no longer present, if there's no signal going through that sound class, in other words, the dialogue sound class, it will recover according to the time constants that we set in SCM Ducker. And then you'll hear it uh, happen again on the end overlap when our other main character, our hero, uh, does its end overlap, it will be pushed and then popped again when uh, this character speaks its line of dialogue. So listen carefully. I think the ship's in trouble! I'm almost done here. Just a few more moments. Okay, so that's not bad. Now, I told you before that uh, sound mixes can be uh, also called from Blueprint Script. So uh, we're going to set up just uh, a little bit of... Uh, I'm not going to use this collision box anymore, as a matter of fact. Uh, I'll even take my AI and just delete it from the world for the time being. Save that. And instead, I'm going to call a line of dialogue that we've already set up from our third person character. Okay, so we're, uh, we're going to edit the main character here. So going back into its blueprint event graph. Uh, again, I'm going to do something simple. Again, I'm not considering this... Uh, a dialogue system per se, but uh, just a way of uh, showing uh, how the Ducker can be implemented. Now, sound mixes can be pushed and popped very easily in Blueprint Script just about anywhere. Uh, just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to use an input for this, a, te a temporary input. I'll just use a keyboard character. So uh, we'll uh, right-click, keyboard E. Okay, and I'll use uh, just for, again, just for simplicity, pressed and released. So on pressed, remember we are inside of the third person character blueprint. On pressed, what we're going to do is uh, push. If I just type the word push, there's only one node, <laughs> push sound mix modifier. So especially, I don't know, if I uncheck context sensitivity, there's a lot more. But if you don't, push sound mix modifier is the only thing there, okay? So we'll do that off of pressed. And off released, guess what? We're going to search for pop. And there we have it, pop sound mix modifier. We have to select the assets now, so uh, that's going to be SCM Ducker in both cases. All right. And uh, in this case, uh, we'll pull off of here, uh, and I'll just say play sound 2D, and we'll use our whichever queue we want. Okay, we'll just use the hero queue because that was for that character in the first place. Uh, I suppose I could have said it's all right. I'll search for it. Hero queue. Great. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. Okay, I'm going to press E and my third person character first will push this sound mix modifier as long as I'm holding down key, uh, the, the E key is going to push the sound mix modifier and play the sound. And then when I release, when I release, it's going to restore, it's going to restore our normal gain because it's going to pop that sound mix modifier, okay? Uh, if I were to have spawned a sound, um, I might be able to get a duration and so forth and follow that with a delay and then pop it that way. But you'll find your own ways to push and pop these. This is just a very, very simple uh, example just using an input. So let's compile and save that. We'll close. 
And uh, now I'll walk around. I'm almost done here. Just a few more moments. So that was just pressing and releasing the E key. If I lingered on the E key for too long, it wouldn't pop that sound mix after his line of dialogue. So let me demonstrate that. I'm almost done here. Just a few more moments. Okay, so right now it's holding on to that sound mix until I release the letter, uh, the letter E on the keyboard. So pushing and popping sound mix modifiers from Blueprint Script is incredibly easy. So that's it, okay? Uh, now you know uh, one more thing that we can use sound classes for and how to passively and I guess actively uh, push and pop sound class mix assets uh, and make them work with our various sound classes. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you next time on Unreal Engine 4 Study Hall. This is Ben Blau for LTU, and I'll see you next time.